Ah, okay, Jason, TJ, I'm so excited for the conversation today. Uh, really grateful that we could come together and, and see where the conversation takes us. I thought uh, the first thing that we would do is, Jason, if you could um, introduce yourself to our audience and share a little bit about your um, professional experience, who you are, and, um, and then we'll see where we go from there. Okay, sounds good. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on the show. Um, so I'm Dr. Jason Schiffman. I'm a psychiatrist. And uh, let's see, I wear a couple different hats. The two main ones are uh, I'm the founder and uh, medical director for the UCLA dual diagnosis program. Uh, and then I'm also the founder and uh, uh, director for the Camden Center. Uh, so the Camden Center is a um, kind of full spectrum mental health uh, program. It does uh, day treatment, so partial hospitalization uh, okay, and so setting it up for a lot. And um, uh, we've got locations in uh, Los Angeles and one in the San Francisco Bay Area. So awesome. Yeah. Very cool. So I thought um, there's a lot of different directions we could take this conversation. I thought, you know, we would just kind of ease into it before we get to the, the heavy stuff, maybe. But I think. Um, one of the things I was really curious about is I know the Camden Center uses conscious recovery. So I'm curious to hear just a little bit about your experience as a psychiatrist using conscious recovery in Camden Center. Sure. So um, the way that I conceptualize what we do at the Camden Center is basically I think of us as to some degree as mechanics. Um, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, like um, automobiles that have problems, um, uh, humans that have mental health problems, and I consider addiction to be, fall within that category. So I don't make a big distinction between addiction and the rest of mental health. And I'm just saying that because from a uh, insurance and, and regulatory standpoint, that carve out happens. But when I say mental health, I, I just for the purposes of our conversation, I'm including addiction. Um, so uh, humans that have these problems, um, you know, often require um, multiple different tools in order to really heal. Um, and in the same way that if you have something wrong with your car and you brought it to a mechanic, you wouldn't want the mechanic to say, well, I use a wrench. <laughs> as long as your car has whatever's wrong with it, you know, if it needs a wrench, then that's, it's gonna get better. Um, and if you need, and if what you've got going on with your car requires something that uses other tools, well, you'll have to kind of go figure that out on your own. I'm, I'm your wrench guy. Um, and unfortunately, I think that the, um, the current mental health care system administers care more or less in that way. Um, and it, it, it puts a tremendous burden and it's a real challenge. It's a, it's a, fair, a real problem for people who are seeking to, to get better. Uh, because not only do they have to find what they believe to be something that might help them, they then almost have to act as the, almost their own case manager or quarterback of their own care and figure out, all right, well, is this all that I'm going to need or do I need something else? And, and, if, and if they're um, um, industrious enough and intelligent enough and have enough resources, you know, they may be able to piece together all of the different pieces. But then they end up in a problem where you know, they've got these multiple different um, specialists working with them, not often communicating effectively, and it's not a great system. And so, you know, that to me, when I looked at, and a lot of this was, is, 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 is my takeaway from my own experience, having been a patient within the mental health care and addiction system when I was younger. Um, and, and really what I view as sort of the fundamental conundrum of, of, of people trying to get better is the fact that the system itself is very disjointed. Um, and that in fact, actually, if you can get people the treatment that they need that is specific to what they need, um, the, the, the outcomes are actually much better than what we typically see in the current system. I don't in fact think that um, uh, addiction and, and mental health care conditions are as treatment refractory or as hopeless as they're often portrayed as. I think actually the fact that we see so much recidivism is more a consequence of what's wrong with the system through which mental health care is administered rather than an inherent feature of these conditions. So. Where does that lead us to the question you actually asked me, which is um, about conscious recovery? Um, you know, unequivocally, um, there is a um, benefit to 
individuals that are trying to recover from mental health care and, and addiction issues, um, if they can um, identify the facet of them that we call spiritual. And that term is a very poorly defined term. It's and because it's so poorly defined, I think physicians and people that tend to be a little bit more on the harder science side of the treatment spectrum tend to shy away from it, um, which is unfortunate, I think, uh, because I think it, you know, there's such evidence that when patients are able to um, identify that facet within themselves and grow that component of them. It can have a, a huge benefit for them in the recovery. Is it all that people need? Well, for some people, it may be all that they need. My experience is, is that for most people, it's a very important component of their recovery. Um, and one of the things that I really like about conscious recovery is that um, it it actually does to some degree what I feel like Camden Center does overall with mental health care, which is attune to what the patient's specific needs are, right? Rather than sort of forcing someone into a, like a conveyor belt or, or um, a rigid predefined way of getting in contact with their spirituality, um, it actually, I feels like helps people discover their own spirituality and does so in a way through encouraging curiosity rather than sort of mandating compliance, I guess would be a way to, 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 to say it. Um, and so I personally have found that that approach really resonates with our general orientation at Camden Center. I've seen it help quite a few of our patients. Um, and so, you know, and, and, and it's a tool, you know, I, again, I, I think of us as mechanics and we've got these, you know, I try to have as many tools in the toolkit as possible. And I want every tool to sort of be a really high quality tool. And so, you know, that, that tool is one that we reach for frequently and one that I frequently find is, is a very useful addition to patient's treatment. So there you go. Excellent. Wow. You said so many things that I want to dig into. It's hard to pick which one I want to start with. <laughs> um, so one thing that you said that was really interesting and uh, a conversation that TJ and I have all the time and a, a conversation that I really enjoy is the power of language. And, and a few things that you mentioned really piqued my curiosity, especially when uh, you spoke to how addiction and mental health are often looked at as two very different things, uh, but but you and Camden Center kind of view it as one and the same. I'm curious if you'd elaborate on that a little bit. Sure, absolutely. So um, my opinion is that the carve out of addiction from the rest of mental health care happened for completely arbitrary sort of historical reasons. Um, and, I'll now say what I think those are. So, you know, until the 1930s, there was no treatment for addiction and most addicts died or ended up, you know, permanently um, uh, in, in, in um, you know, mental health care institutions. Um, and fortunately, um, in the 1930s, um, AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, came around and it became the the uh, it was like, the, it was almost, I, I view it almost to some degree as like the discovery of penicillin, <laughs> right? You know, um, it was th this incredible, effective treatment where now this huge population of people who had a, a, a condition that, that more often than not resulted in death, um, and if it didn't resulted in significant morbidity, um, now we had something that was actually, that actually worked. And um, that presented a conundrum for the healthcare industry, which was that 12 step is not a clinically administered modality. So, um, and yet it was the only tool that was available to treat this patient population. And so um, it, it, it presented a problem from a sort of regulatory and insurance based standpoint. How do you how, how do insurance companies make decisions about what constitutes addiction care and, and who can provide it? Um, and how do you regulate who provides it if the, 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 the uh, mechanism of providing it doesn't require anyone to have a license or any, you know, it's not, a, like I said, it's not a clinically administered, it's a, it's a community-based um, approach that involves one alcoholic helping another alcoholic. So, um, and, and again, this conundrum or problem, again, was only a problem from a logistical standpoint. It was a problem from a regulatory standpoint. And so what ended up happening is um, uh, systems ended up being developed to say, okay, well, 
if you want to start a center and treat addiction, you can get licensed as an addiction center, but that's different than a mental health center. If you want to start a mental health center, you want to provide mental health services, then you have to be a clinician and you have to have had, you know, have a degree of that, that, that the state recognizes as one where you are legally allowed to provide that type of service. Um, and this, by the way, I think was the right approach. I mean, that was the necessary approach at the time. We and and it enabled, you know, um, uh, this thing that that emerged outside of the the healthcare system to be integrated into the rest of healthcare. Um, now we're sort of left with the legacy, though, of that origin of of addiction treatment. And what that legacy is is that we now have a system that that, in a regulatory way makes a distinction between addiction treatment and mental health treatment. And unfortunately, I think that for what I would say is the majority of people who end up with an addiction, in fact, I might even say everyone who ends up with an addiction, um, there is a significant mental health component that was the origin, or let's put it this way, predated the development of the addiction. Right. I think of addiction as a solution that's become its own problem. Right. So if you get people to stop drinking or stop using drugs, you have you will you will by definition have solved the problem associated with the with or the consequences of the of the use. But you now have taken away from them the only tool often that they had for solving this other much quieter problem that predated that for years, which is the fact that walking around in the world being them doesn't feel good. Twelve step is a way for people to. Um, to address that problem. Um, I think the limitation of 12 step is that because it's not a psychotherapeutic orientation, it doesn't actually really get at the roots of why someone feel, walks around in the world feeling bad. They, and, and I think if you read the 12 step literature, it will say that about itself. It doesn't, 12 step doesn't make any hypotheses about what the etiology or cause of the spiritual malady, that's what they call it, is, which is they believe is the source of, 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 of um, the, the dysphoria that leads to drinking. They just say, well, some, some people have this, maybe they're born with it, maybe they're, they don't have, they, they're, they're agnostic as to why it, 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 it emerges. Fortunately, I think we're at a place in the history and the development of mental health care where we can actually be a little more sophisticated and from a more, clinical standpoint, actually have ideas about why somebody ends up as an adult who, when they walk around in the world, doesn't feel good. And thus, when they experiment with drugs or alcohol, as most normal kids do. In fact, I'm, when I meet a kid who tells me he's never smoked pot, I'm actually more concerned about them than if I meet kids that do smoke pot, right? So it's, it's normal. And I would even go so far as to say probably socially healthy for kids to experiment with drugs and alcohol. Um, and, and the vast majority of people who do don't develop addiction. Those who develop an addiction, I think, do so in large part because when they experience the euphoria of that addictive, of, of that drug or alcohol or whatever other addictive behavior they're engaging in, they're not just experiencing euphoria, they're experiencing euphoric relief. They're experiencing relief from chronic emotional pain. And it's very difficult when you walk around in chronic emotional pain and you have had an experience that, that numbs you out from that, not to keep going back and doing that over and over again. And so, um, you know, so my feeling is, is that at this point, the, the, the separation of addiction treatment from mental health treatment is actually a disservice to those trying to recover because fundamentally, I think that in order to recover, and this gets back to my toolkit analogy, you know, you need multiple tools, the spiritual tool and, and all of the other benefits that you get from 12 step, for example, and conscious recovery, those are really important tools. And if you really want to heal the origin of what was causing the dysphoria, I do believe that it is important to go in and this could, I could go on for two hours about this or more, but it's, it's about healing your sense of self. If you walk around with a sense of self that is rooted in shame, so guilt is feeling like you did something bad, shame is feeling like you are something bad, if you have a sense of, of self that has too much shame in it, that in my experience has essentially been almost without exception, the true cause of what leads people to addiction inevitably, so. Absolutely, Absolutely. I love that. TJ, I wanted to hear um, your thoughts on that. I mean, I, I heard so many things that, that resonate so closely with conscious recovery. I'm curious to, to see what clicked for you. 
Yeah, I mean, so many things. Thank you, Jason, so much for everything that you spoke to. Um, and I could go back to many points, but let's start with the most recent one, which is the conversation of shame and the identity and the belief in our own brokenness. And I, I feel like that's why you and I collaborate so well, because you also are talking about you know, the different rooms, physical, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual. And there is not one tool. I really love the analogy, right? I'm going in to get something fixed in my car that a wrench is not going to actually help with this. Perfect analogy, right? And so the idea that addiction has been seen as the problem for so many years then would also indicate, as you said, that if we eradicate the problem, everything's great. But what we actually know, and even um, every, I think all of us agree to some extent that it's a symptom of something or it's um, a behavior. And when I got into you know, recovery myself and then started working in the addiction treatment field, I realized there's so much focus on the symptoms, the behaviors, and there's so much categorizing and classifying and treating. And so I came into this uh, world, this creation of conscious recovery as a different tool to help people really get down to what's actually happening, to shift the conversation from treating to healing, right? And I, I one of my favorite conversations with you, Jason, is the whole idea about um, uh, the DSM and what we call personality disorders. And I agree completely that they've been in these two camps and there's been this assumption well, addiction is a disease, period. So then it must be organic. It must be chemical. There's something happening there. Once we treat that, everything's going to be great. But the shame that you're speaking to is one of the deep root causes, right? The belief in our own brokenness. And so in conscious recovery, we call addiction a brilliant strategy, right? It's not a coping mechanism. It's not a defense mechanism. It's actually a brilliant strategy. And the reason I love hearing you talk is you say things that most people wouldn't, which is like, it's really healthy for kids to experiment with drugs and alcohol, right? And so the issue though, as you're speaking to, is if someone believes they're fundamentally flawed or broken, and to me, that is a spiritual disconnection. And I just mean a disconnection from the essential self. Of course, we're going to look to someone, something, some behavior outside of ourselves to try to medicate or manage that. And as you said, if we take away that, what are we left with? We're left with this belief in brokenness. And the foundational principle of conscious recovery is underneath all of that, there is still a whole and perfect person, right? So recovery or mental health treatment, which I would like to really talk about how we can heal it, um, is a returning to that. And it's unlearning all the other stuff that we've been taught uh, the trauma that we've experienced, the disconnection and the shame. And I, what I'll, the last thing I'll say at this moment uh, is um, what you spoke to in the beginning is what if, I like what ifs, you know, and I appreciate that you talked about conscious recovery being curious. What if people can heal? Uh, what if people can actually source something inside of themselves? Now, that doesn't mean they can do it alone. We're here to support them. But what if they have inner resources that can actually help them return to their wholeness where they're not medicating? Totally different paradigm. And part of it, I think, is maybe it's unconscious, but I think that we as an industry, mental health and addiction treatment, we've kind of been in this cycle of treat the symptoms, treat the symptoms, they come back to us, treat the symptoms, treat the symptoms, they come back to us. And we're on this repetitive loop with our clients. And I think it's really interesting that we will often say to a client who's back to treatment for the fourth time, what are you gonna do differently? Well, I mean, that's a question, it's a valid one, but what are we gonna do differently? And I think the big difference is what if I started to recognize that my clients could actually heal? They don't have a permanent disorder, perhaps. Uh, I, again, I don't like to say this is the answer because I don't have the answers and that's the biggest relief of my life, but I have a lot of questions. And one of the questions is what if they can actually heal from this? What if this isn't a permanent condition? What if they're not disordered at all, but they're actually using all of these different things in order to manage something? Can we get curious about that? So yeah. that's why I love partnering with you, Jason, because we're, we come from, a, in some ways, a different place, but we come to a very similar place as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually, I'd like to just comment on something you just said that I think is really important, because I think it ends up being a bit of a red herring. Um, 
where people get locked into this argument that becomes very emotional about whether people can recover from addiction or whether you can just treat it. Meaning is this a, and this is something where, you know, people will say, no, it's a, it's, it's a chronic disease like diabetes and you can manage it, but you never heal from it. And, um, and people tend to, like I said, there, there tends to be a lot of emotion around that discussion. And I, I think it is a bit of a red herring. Um, and, and I think that it, um, you know, and if we just sort of actually unpack the language around that and talk a little bit more specifically and get a little more granular about what we mean, I actually think most people in all camps actually probably more or less agree about it uh, because it's not, but, but again, I think that unfortunately, and I think the source of this, this comes from the fact that because there was so much stigma against addiction for so yeah. long uh, and because it was viewed for so long as, a, as a, um, a, um, an indication of a, a character, a logic flaw within somebody, I do think that there, we currently are living in an era where the pendulum for good reason has swung back in this other direction where people are very emphatic about saying, look, no, this is really a disease. This really is something that is not just a matter of people having poor, uh, you know, insufficient willpower or, or um, having, um, you know, a poor character. This is really a health condition. Um, and because of that, the language that has been chosen around that, I think, has been, you know, the con, like, for example, cause it, even cause it calling it a disease, right? It's like in mental health, it's the only thing that we, the term disease gets used for. We don't call depression a disease. I mean, it's more or less synonyms, right? You call it a disorder or a disease. I don't know, they're synonyms, but they have different connotations. You know, disease evokes a um, more of a, a feeling that I think is, and I think the reason for that, again, is because it is in reaction to the years, the generations, I mean, all the way back to when we were probably, you know, we first crushed grapes and discovered, first discovered marijuana, you know, the first uh, presence of addiction, it goes back to this historic, very entrenched idea that addiction was somehow not really a health condition or a mental health condition. It was, it was a, it was a flaw in a person's character. So getting back to unpacking the language around that a little bit, look, what I think there is more or less uniform agreement about, and maybe there's some outliers that don't agree with this, but across the spectrum, Almost everyone will, who works in the field of addiction, even the ones on an opposite camps, what most everyone will agree with is that if you have become addicted to a substance, you have lost the ability for the rest of your life to ever use that substance in moderation again. That is more or less not a controversial statement, meaning I don't know of any treatment center or any modality out there or any uh, addiction medicine individual who's trying to say or believes that you can somehow work with <laughs> an opioid addict who's shooting, you know, you know, grams of heroin a day to, to go back and just use, you know, Vicodin one, once or twice a day and use it in moderation or an alcoholic who can go back and do just moderate drinking. That is the part that I think we can have agreement about is chronic. Like, you know, something has, and I have ideas that are probably, you know, a little too um, specific and long, <laughs> long explanations for to go into now about what's going on neurologically that underlies that. But that's the part that I think is really important to grab onto. And I, I actually do weekly psychoeducation lectures for my UCLA program. And, and this is really a topic that I think is important for people to understand. Contrasting the the fact, the fact, I believe it's a fact that if you're an alcoholic, you're never going to drink alcohol in moderation again. Your, your relationship with alcohol has become binary. You are either abstinent or you are drinking alcoholically. You have forever lost the ability to be a moderate drinker. That is true. That is something, that is a disease, if you want to call it that, that you will have forever. What's not true, I think, and or in my opinion, but this is, is but I think it's important to just tease apart as a separate issue, whether regardless of what your opinion on, we need to agree that it's a separate issue, is whether you are able to heal as a human being and go out and actually be freed from all of the symptoms uh, of, of, of addiction, the cravings, the, the depression, the anxiety, all of that stuff. And that to me is a separate issue. And I personally believe, as I believe that you do, people can become wholly healed in that regard. Um, and does that mean once they're wholly healed that then they can go back and drink in moderation? No. That's the important piece to understand. Yes, you can totally heal. You can get all the way better and you can have a life that is as healthy as someone maybe who never had any addiction. 
And what is also true is that if you are able to achieve that, that still doesn't mean you're going to be able to go back and drink non-alcoholically. You are for, your relationship with alcohol has forever now been made binary. And I think as long as we parse it out like that and understand that these are separate things, I don't think there's a lot of disagreement. I don't think that fundamentally people are going to disagree about it. And that's why I think this whole idea of the arguing about whether it's a chronic disease or whether you can really recover or not is a bit of a red herring. People get all upset about it. And, and in reality, I think it's important to just be a little bit more detailed about what we mean so we can tease apart the parts that really don't ever change and the parts that can change. Yeah, I love that because I have said before, especially with clients that are pretty new in recovery, when I say that we can actually heal addiction, inevitably one person will say, oh good, does that mean I can use again? And that's not what we're saying. But what we're saying is, as Jason said so beautifully, they are separate issues, but I want to dive a little bit deeper into something because I think it's really important. There, along with the idea that we have a lifelong chronic illness that can only be treated one day at a time, because that's kind of what one camp is saying. And I agree, it's so easy because our minds are this or that or black and white, right? And it's so easy to get into a debate. And that's not really why we're doing this show. We're doing this show to say, what are the deeper possibilities here? And how do we start to shift into serving more people and really actually helping people begin to heal, right? And that's really what this conversation is about. But I think uh, what is interesting about that whole paradigm of a lifelong chronic illness is that along with it, not everyone, but there are certainly people who I hear say, I will always have this alcoholic mind. I will always be broken because I'm an alcoholic. I, I literally heard someone once that was 25 years sober say, well, I'm just an effed up alcoholic, so I don't know how to do relationships. And I'm, and I'm sitting there thinking, well, then it's true, right? If I have that belief system, if I'm still coming from shame, and I think it's really nuanced but important to say, when we start to heal the shame, we don't have to believe that we're bodily and mentally different because that's one of the conversations, right? Now, that may be true. But in my experience, when I heal the shame and when I heal the trauma, and that's an ongoing process, I don't want to, I don't need to take on the identity that I have this permanent ailment that creates me having a way of relating to myself in the world that may or may not be true, right? And I got sober really young. So sometimes people will say, well, how do you even know that you have an addiction? Why do you even not use? And my answer is actually very simple. The more I've been in recovery and the more I've healed my shame and my disconnection and my trauma, I have a very, very beautiful, rich and full life. Why would I want to medicate that? And as you said, I have seen people that have used again and I'm like, wow, they seem to be doing okay but then there's usually a turning point where it doesn't go so well. So simply said, there is no reason that I would wanna use dr drugs and alcohol because it cannot possibly enhance my life. And so then I take it out of the conversation of the, I wonder if I could use normally because that's, that's just an addiction thought, right? I wonder if I could uh, to really, what is the deeper transformation that's happening here? Yeah. And if I can actually bounce off that, I mean, I just using that example, because that is something that you will hear quite frequently of in, in 12 step is, you know, well, I'm because I'm an alcoholic, I'm fucked up, you know, I, I don't know how to do this and that. And, and, and I do, I think, again, if we look back to the origins of sort of the history of, ad of addiction treatment, you know, look, if you read the big book, it says in there very clearly that, you know, this is this is a treatment for addiction. And it doesn't claim to have to be the only treatment for addiction, but but importantly, what what I what what it says and what I believe to be true is look, um, it doesn't say it expl as explicitly as I'm about to say it right now, but a 12 step is not a treatment for developmental trauma. 12 step is not a treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder. 12 step is not a treatment for bipolar disorder, which you know I put in a slightly different category than the other ones. But the point that I'm getting at is that look. 12-step is an undeniably an effective treatment for addiction. Um, and if we believe, which I do, that almost all, if not all, people who end up with addiction do so because they have these other conditions, and then they use a tool that very, for them very effectively solves the addiction piece, but don't use any other tools to address this other stuff, 
I view it a little bit like having like 12 step in that regard is like having really good gardening shears. You know, it's like you've got this plant of dysphoria or of social or, or, of, or of spiritual um, 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 malaise or whatever you want to call it that or shame, you know, that keeps growing. And 12 step is an amazing set of gardening shears that helps you take an unmanageable life and a painful life that needed alcohol to numb and keep cutting, keep cutting it back so that it's manageable. And if you stop going to meetings, I mean, you put the shears down and you never did anything else and the plant's still growing, it's going to keep growing. And that's why what you will hear in at least culturally in 12 step is look, if you stop going to meetings, you're going to relapse and then you'll die. And I, you know, and the fact is, if you, all you ever do is 12 step and you never address any of the other stuff, that may very well be true because you've let go of the gardening shears that are helping you manage an otherwise unmanageable problem. And all I'm saying is that, look, fortunately, nowadays, we actually have an understanding that there is this other problem that was that, 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 that alcohol was originally or other drugs was a solution to. And we have treatments for that. And you can actually heal from that problem. And, you know, metaphorically using that metaphor, you can pull that plant out by the roots so that the plant's not growing. Your, your shame tree isn't growing anymore, you know? Um, so anyway, I just, um, to me, that's how I make sense of all of, of all this. And again, you know, obviously there's a lot of different opinions about it. And, you know, and again, people get very emotional about it, understandably, because, you know, for a lot of people going to a 12 step meeting every day is the thing that keeps them alive. And so I think that, you know, if you're in that situation, you know, I think to some degree, there's a necessity in believing, especially if you've been doing it for 20 years, there's a necessity in believing that like, this is the only way to do it, you know, um, anyway. I'm actually really really glad that the conversation went this way because I, I have so many questions about this specifically. And one of, the, one of the questions I get very often, especially in relation to conscious recovery is, you know, because uh, in conscious recovery, the, the three root causes of, of addiction are unresolved trauma, toxic shame, and spiritual disconnection. And if we're able to heal those things and, and, reconnect with our true essential nature and who we are in the world. Um, oftentimes the question I get is, well, if those parts of, of myself are healed and I was using alcohol as the solution, uh, then once those are healed and 10 years goes by, in theory, why would alcohol then become a problem if those things are healed? Now I have my own opinions on that, but it is something I get often. I'm curious to hear what both of you have to say about that. Well, I, I mean, to me, this is, you know, the development at the, in terms of the development of the actual addiction piece, it's just straight up what you could think of as operant conditioning, right? So operant conditioning is basically when you, is the approach of, of, of um, eliciting or training um, uh, an, an organism, often a rat in a laboratory to, um, how to, um, engage in a certain behavior based upon a certain stimulus. And there's certain mechanisms of operant conditioning, you know, they're, um, uh, um, positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, uh, things called positive punishment, negative punishment. Um, we don't need to go into all of the theory about operant conditioning, but, you know, to me, the issue with, look, addiction is like a lake that's got a million different little tributaries and streams that run to it. And everybody ends up at the same lake. <laughs> um, what the problem with the, once you're at the lake, what the problem is, is that you have exposed your brain to an unnaturally rewarding substance over and over and over again. Like fundamentally the way that human brains evolved, the way our reward pathway evolved is if you like something, you your brain does, uh, develops a wanting for that thing, which makes evolutionarily, that makes perfect sense, right? The nature couldn't have possibly, uh, uh, evolution couldn't possibly have anticipated all of the different combinations of things that might be good for us. And so it gave us certain desires and certain um, responses to stimulus. And if we do something that, that, make, that we feel good about, we develop a desire to repeat that experience, right? If I take my kids to Disneyland and they have a great time at Disneyland, you know, for the next year, they're like, let's go back to Disneyland. You know, they develop a, a desire to repeat the pleasurable experience. Um, and that is healthy and normal. Um, and the thing about the thing that unifies all of the substances and behaviors that humans become addicted to is they were all substances and behaviors that did not exist in the environment that we evolved in. And they are all are unnaturally rewarding, meaning they create such a strong drive 
because they create such a significant amount of euphoria. And there's other things that has to do with how quickly it hits you, how quickly it peaks and how quickly it goes away. Um, those, those things all will determine the extent to which your reward pathway responds to a stimulus that you find pleasurable. But, but you know, the, when you expose a human brain to these things that did not exist in our natural environment, and I'll, you know, cocaine, alcohol, um, internet pornography, um, all of the other things that people can get addicted to, um, what happens fundamentally is we develop a drive that is stronger than the inhibitory strength of our prefrontal cortex. Basically, the way our brains work is our prefrontal cortex is our executive that's getting pinged all over the place by all of these submodules wanting us to do different things, right? I kind of have to pee right now. And so there's a part of my brain that's going, you should go pee. And then my executive's going, nope, not a good time to do that because I'm in the middle of doing an interview. So my prefrontal cortex has an ability to inhibit my drive to pee because it's not an appropriate time to do that because it got information from other parts of my brain that let it know that now wouldn't be a good time to pee. Um, you know, when you're a cocaine addict and you get pinged by the, the part of your brain that's just dedicated to learning, knowing about cocaine and giving you a drive to repeat that experience, um, it sends a drive to your prefrontal cortex that says, hey, let's go do some cocaine. And you may be getting information from all other parts of your brain, like your, 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 the, the part that radiates your attachment and morality and your planning and your logic and your anxiety. You know, hey, it's my kid's birthday tomorrow and somebody, I'm at a party and somebody wants me to go do some coke. It's like, there's gonna be all parts of my brain that say, don't do it. But if I'm a cocaine addict, and I'm my cocaine addict part that says saying go do it. If the if the if the if the strength of that drive has gotten to a point where the that it exceeds the ability, the inhibitory power of my prefrontal cortex to reliably inhibit it, guess what? Now the cocaine drive is the new executive. It's the one making the decisions, and it's not you as a whole person. All all your cocaine module knows about is stimulus related to cocaine and pushing a button that makes you want to go do it. So. And, and the, 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 what appears to be the case is that once the magnitude of that drive raises past that inhibitory threshold, it doesn't ever really go back down. It just, that whole file just kind of in our, gets closed and put away so that if you get enough distance from it, it's not there in your consciousness. But if you go back and re-expose yourself to that stimulus, then boom, the, 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 the intensity of that drive is right there waiting for you. And that's why you have this, to, to answer your question or the question that you say people ask you, well, if I'm a whole person, I'm happy, I'm healthy, all of the things that, that were the sources of my pain that led me to use as a solution have gone away. Why can't I now use? The reason is, is because you still have that module in there that, that to drive for alcohol or cocaine that's set at a level that is above your Front, prefrontal cortex's ability to inhibit it. And if you start doing it again, <laughs> you will be right back in that scenario where you're try, your prefrontal cortex is trying to inhibit you from doing it and yet you're doing it over and over again. So that to me is a little bit more of a, the neurological context as a process, neural processing context as to why um, you, know, you can't just, once you heal, go back to using again. I love that. And this is why I love our collaboration and our conversations, because again, you're, you're taking the, the science piece, the, the physical piece, the mental piece, and then br we're bridging that and coming to a very, very similar conclusion. And before I go on my little answer, I also want to say, Jeremy, I want to hear your answer to this too afterward, because I, I would really love to hear your perspective on that question. For me, what, the way I want to talk about it is uh, through this, you know, the spiritual or the emotional piece, and it's about identity, right? And so going back to one of the things that we spoke of earlier, if I have the identity that I'm broken, if I have an identity that I'm a victim, or if I have an identity that there's something inherently wrong with me, I'm always going to be looking for something to medicate that or to manage that, right? And what I love about what you're saying, Jason, is we're not saying once we have reconnected with our essential truth, once we've worked on our trauma and shame to a degree that we're then going to, here, here's the interesting thing about the human mind, right? Because we're saying, once we have reconnected with our essential truth, once we've done a degree of healing the trauma and the shame and the disconnection, then the human mind says, oh good, then I can drink and use again. Isn't that interesting? 
But if we really reconnect and as we really connect, that becomes not even the conversation. And that's why I really want to focus uh, in my work and in the reason I love working with you, Jason, is that you talk about this too in a slightly different yet similar way. And that is, if I am believing that I have this chronic lifelong illness that I must treat, I'm continuing to take on that identity. And then at some point, like you said, if I'm not giving it, if I stop my daily treatment, then I'm going to go back to it. Or if something traumatic happens in my life, you know, how many times have we heard, well, my, my partner died and I started using again, right? Um, we have the inner resources to work with that when we have reconnected with our essential truth, when we have become more whole again or recognize our wholeness again. And so then it becomes, wow, I wouldn't even want to drink or use. That's a very different conversation, right? So it becomes paradoxical in a way because the person that's hearing us say, uh, they might hear it and we're not saying this, but someone through their lens might say, oh, I can heal from addiction and then drink or use again. Well, they're at a developmental stage where that would be their hope, right? Because they're looking for a way for someone to say, oh, I can drink and use again. But what I'm saying spiritually and what we put, propose in conscious recovery is, when we return to our wholeness, we are no longer going to desire to drink or use again. And so one way to say it through the spiritual lens is when I know deeply the truth of who and what I am, I don't want to medicate that. I have a life on purpose. I have a life of connection. I have a life of joy. And interestingly enough, take the whole addiction story out or the whole addiction perspective. The people that I know that I work with that are on a very deep spiritual path, they're not using drugs and alcohol because they're not wanting to medicate the deep spiritual experience. So I wanted to add that in. And that's why I love our conversations because we're addressing these different rooms. And um, of course, Jeremy, I, I wanna hear where you're at with it too, because we wanna hear from you. <laughs> yeah, of course. I, well, I, I really appreciate uh, both of you guys' response because I know, you know, I go to conferences, I get CEs, you know, so I, I understand the very basics of the brain, but I think Jason, the way you worded it with uh, a file being kind of stored away, I thought that was brilliant because that's exactly how I view it. And the example I use whenever I'm faced with that question is for me, it's been over 11 years since I've done cocaine. And if I, if I think back to the last time I did cocaine, I feel a lot of different things happen. I feel myself, uh, watching myself go through the ritual of getting it, getting home, getting some alcohol, putting it out. And I watch what happens in my brain and the physiological reactions that I have, and they are still very present. And I, I, leave a, I, I lead a very beautiful life. I'm, I'm proud of my life. I love my life. And I watch those things happen. And I say, well, isn't that interesting? I don't feel broken. I don't feel disconnected. I don't feel... Um, depressed or lonely or isolated or anything like that. And yet, even now, when I think about cocaine, I experience the same physiological drive uh, that says that'll be a lot of fun if I went and did that. I would feel really good if I went and did that. And I think to echo what TJ said, that, that spiritually, the way I view it is, uh, if I am waking up in the morning and going through my day, as a whole and perfect spiritual being and I do feel connected and even if I don't feel connected but I'm in pursuit of connection I feel like I don't want anything that'll dampen that I don't want anything to slow it down or get in the way and I think that is really the the beauty of the spiritual journey is recognizing that it's not a I can't it's a I choose not to mm -hmm. yeah very well said and um Yes, and I and I uh, the once I think it just said another way, it's that you know once you heal the problem that the drugs or alcohol was originally a solution for, doesn't undo the fact that you became an addict to this thing. You know, and and one of the terms they they, they the phrases they use in twelve step is you know you, you know they talk about well you can't unpickle a pickle you can't un, un you can't uncook a steak, and again this is one of the things for which there is pretty broad agreement across you know the the treatment landscape is that 
you, you know, once, once you have developed an addiction to something, and again, neurologically, I say that is once the, the reward, um, the strength of the motivational factor of that reward pathway that's associated with that behavior exceeds the ability of your prefrontal cortex to reliably inhibit it, uh, inhibit it that, that doesn't ever go back. Yeah, and I want to. I want to ask. I actually want to ask you a question too, Jason. Because as you're talking, I was sitting with what fear creates, right? And so, if I'm in a paradigm that I have a lifelong chronic illness, or even if we take addiction off the table, and I say, well, I have this disorder called borderline personality disorder. I'm going to have this forever. It's going to be chemical. I can only treat it with medication and therapy. If I'm in fear and I'm continuing to view myself through the lens of brokenness or something's wrong with me, my question for you is like, what does that create? Because the paradigm that I hear that's pretty deeply entrenched with addiction is uh, don't take your eyes off of treating your addiction every day because you could relapse, right? And I understand the spirit of that. And I even agree with that, that yes, there are things I do every single day for my recovery, my spiritual well well-being, my mental health. There, undoubtedly that that is really an important part of life. But when there's a fear, there's something that gets activated when I'm afraid, oh my gosh, what if I relapse again? Or, or what if I have these symptoms again? And I'm walking around in fear. And so I'm wondering from really any of the rooms, physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual, what is the impact of fear in the viewpoint, right? Because I keep going back to the identity. What happens when I view myself as broken? what happens when I view myself as whole and I've lost the ability for whatever reason to recognize that. So I have this all sorts of behaviors and symptoms and um, uh, interesting strategies for survival. I'm just curious if you have anything you could say about that and what that might create either, you know, in your own life, in, in life of patients or even philosophically. Well, so two things. W one is, you know, to me, the way that you define what an anxiety disorder is, is when you have anxiety in the context of something that isn't actually dangerous, right? Because if it was, if, if it was dangerous, then it wouldn't be an anxiety disorder, it would be appropriate anxiety, right? So be, being afraid of somebody shooting you with a gun, if there's a person in front of you with a gun, that's not an anxiety disorder. Being afraid of somebody shooting you with a gun when there's nobody around you with a gun and you're in a nice neighborhood, that, that is an anxiety disorder, right? And, and maybe PTSD because you were used to be in a scenario where people did shoot at you. Um, so I, I think in terms of what you were talking about with respect to the vigilance around relapse and treating the addiction, um, I think that in the same, in, by the same token of the, with the example that I just gave where you know, if you're in Vietnam and people are shooting at you, it's appropriate to be afraid and vigilant. If the Vietnam War has been over for 20 years and you're, you know, living in Hemet and you're still having nightmares, you know, that's now you've got post-traumatic stress disorder, right? Um, being vigilant and afraid of relapsing is not, I don't think that's inappropriate in the phases of early recovery. I mean, it is hard as hell to get, to get sober. Um, and, um, I mean, really hard. I mean, I would say it was one of the hardest things that I've ever had to do in my life. Um, and, you know, I view it in some ways as, you know, it's like your addiction is a little bit like this black hole that you're, or a very, or an object with a lot of gravity. And at the beginning, it's like, you're really close and you're just like trying every day to take another step away without falling back, you know, and eventually, you know, you're just putting one foot in front of the other. Right. And, um, and, and, and when you're close and, you know, when you're in early recovery, you know, which for me, that's probably the first couple of years, you know, it does make sense to be vigilant, you know, especially because it, your addiction is sneaky. <laughs> she turns away like, I'll just drive by that place that I used to, to buy drugs. You know, it's a shorter, it's a shorter route right now. Um, uh, and as we take those steps, hopefully successfully one day at a time, moving away from it, you know, the level of anxiety, I think, you know, what, what's appropriate anxiety starts to, to change. Um, and I think that, maybe what you're getting at there um, is when does it start to become okay to have your sense of identity not be, oh, I'm a broken addict. I'm an addict, right? I mean, we tend to have our sense of identity be determined by a confluence of 
the people that were around us when we were growing up and the, our developmental experiences and then what's happening right now. If what's happening right now is you're an alcoholic who just got sober at, you know, after 15 years of using and in your first 30 days of recovery, it probably is appropriate to be identifying with your alcoholism at that point. Mm. You know, if it's three years out and you're still just identifying with like, I'm an alcoholic and you're not really looking and that's your whole identity. I do think that that starts to move from being a very adaptive way of viewing yourself into being one that maybe starts to become more of an impediment in terms of really actually healing what's going on underneath. Because I couldn't agree with you more that, you know, fundamentally what is at the core of all of us who become addicts is shame and this idea that we're not okay, we're not lovable, we're not good in some way, you know, in a million different ways we could be not good or bad or whatever. Um, and the, the paradox or the irony about becoming an addict is it sort of reinforces this identified patient role that we tend to get into where it's like the very thing that we did to try to numb ourselves out to to, to manage this uncomfortable shame actually now has resulted in us being in this role of like, oh wait, I'm the bad one because I'm an addict. Um, so that's that's the way that I think about it. I don't think, you know, like most things in, in medicine, you know, most things in medicine are not either or. Most things in medicine are what do you do now based upon the context and what you do right, the right thing to do right now may not be the right thing to do two months from now or five minutes from now, depending upon how the data is changing and how people, you know, ideally, hopefully people are getting better. So the, what was necessary when somebody was 30 days sober should probably be different once they're five years sober, once they're 10 years sober, once they're 15 years sober. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, we're coming up on two o'clock, you guys. So I want to be mindful of our time. And I, uh, I thought maybe what we could do is just uh, get some final thoughts, TJ, if you had some before we sign off. I, I find my mind surprisingly and refreshingly empty at this moment, but I will say that I am, I just, I, when in doubt, go to gratitude. I love our conversation. Uh, I think what, what I really appreciate about the way we've come together is we're really talking about opening up different possibilities. Uh, you know, a lot of times, again, th this is a little bit of um, me reiterating something I said earlier, but, you know, the human mind tends to want to sort and separate good, bad, right, wrong. You know, that mechanism is, is put in there for survival. Is this safe? You know, it must be good. It must be bad. And I think that the, the medical profession, the mental health profession, the addiction uh, treatment industry, in a way, maybe somewhat unconsciously has adopted good, bad, right, wrong. And I think what I appreciate about this conversation is I don't think any of the three of us said I have the answer. We really have a lot of questions though. You know, what does it create when I view this in that way? What does it create when I believe I have this lifelong chronic illness? What if I can actually start to heal? What would my life look like if I were to start to shift my identity? I love what Jason said about the shame and then the behavior that creates more shame. That's the shame spiral, right? I feel broken. I find some way to try to heal that in the world or to fix that or to shift that. And then it creates more shame, right? So hurt people hurt people. And I've hurt a lot of people in my life. And it has always been because I believed I was broken or damaged and I was acting that way in the world. Addiction was perfect, a perfect storm with that. I felt broken. I used this. I brought It brought relief, but then it brought more shame. And that's that downward spiral. So what I want to say in closing for anyone who's watching this either live or, you know, in, in, a, in a replay is that uh, what we want to offer is that there are a lot of different tools out there and we encourage you to explore what works for you in this moment. I really appreciate the analogy of the wrench. It's so clear, right? Um, I did need a wrench in the beginning and then I needed something else later. And then I needed to go back to that wrench sometimes. And that analogy is so perfect, right? We're not one dimensional uh, beings. Uh, we're, there are multiple layers to us uh, as human beings, as spiritual beings. Uh, and what if I could be open to the infinite possibilities rather than thinking I need to discover the answer? Beautiful. Well, Jason, thank you so much for joining us today. I got a lot out of this conversation. I really hope that we get an opportunity to do another one um, because I would love to pick your brain about the brain. Uh, it's, I, it's just fascinating to me and I, I really do appreciate uh, the different perspectives. And I want to echo what TJ said too, that if you're watching and fundamentally disagree with all three of us on everything we said, we welcome that. We invite that. 
uh, like TJ said, we're just asking questions and kind of poking and prodding and seeing what we can, uh, what we can learn together. So um, Jason, thank you again. TJ, thank you so much. And thank you everybody who was watching and um, we will see you on the next Conscious Conversation. All right, Jeremy, TJ, thank you so much. Thank you, Jason. Thank, thank you, you for being our guest today. Bye, guys.